SJC 12961, Robert Malloy and another, the Department of Correction. Thank you. And Ms. Greenberg. Uh, please the court. I'm, I'm looking for Justice Kafka here because he asked the right questions when I was here in Buckman versus Department of Corrections last year. Uh, the reason people aren't being released on their day 66 as a practical matter is because the department is not preparing the medical parole plans. If medical parole plans were prepared, the department could release on the 66th day. They're just not doing their job. And that brings us to the problem that we have here. Uh, in no case is the department doing it. And we, they're just not doing it. Uh, and last year I said I had, I expressed my good faith that if this court were to require the department to do it, the department would, but the department doesn't. So that's why Mr. Malloy and Mr. Vinny were held past the 66 days. There was really nowhere yet planned for them to go. Now, whether the, what the department is basically arguing here is two things. First, they're saying that there is actually no uh, statutory limit uh, on, on the time that a person can be kept in custody following a grant of medical parole. That seems impossible. I mean, the whole medical parole statute is uh, exquisitely time bound. There's a calendar, day one to day 66. The total contingent parole plan is supposed to be done by day 21. I'm in complete agreement with the parole board who joins me on this. It's supposed to be done. Then they're supposed to check it in between 20, day 22 to day whatever. And out there, after that time, parole conditions are supposed to be set. And the only thing- Can I ask you a question about uh, just procedurally? Yeah. So are you saying that um, the commissioner granted medical parole without a parole plan being, a medical parole plan being in place? Yes. Okay. Well, so isn't that the problem? I mean, why, why were they granted parole if there was no, um, no provisions for them, uh, for their care or for where they would stay? I don't, well, I don't get that. Because the department has the obligation to make the plan. No, I understand that. So how could the commissioner make a decision without having the plan. It's just, they, it's just really foggy on all these cases. I mean, some of the cases that I have on 249 for now, the superior court sends, sends it back to the department to make plans for, Ger in Jerry Adri's case, which I appended the record to, to the reply, the court sent it back to the department for plans four times in uh, Abercrombie versus Department of Corrections, Judge Pasquale just sent it back for the department to make a plan. In, uh, in Prendergast versus DOC, they sent it back for the department to make a plan. That's because when the judges order release, they need to have a place to release to. But and would you just remind me, were these, were these cases where that happened um, pre-Buckman so that the commissioner didn't, or the DOC didn't do it because they weren't, they didn't realize they were supposed to do it? I have to veer a little bit off the record. Um, uh, the Buckman was decided uh, January 20 some. At that time, I had people uh, with petitions pending and also people who had already been denied. And I uh, reminded the department that Buckman existed and the department took the position that they would not prepare medical parole plans for people whose uh, petitions had already been acted on. I filed new petitions in order to have medical parole plans created. But the medical parole plans that are created by the department uh, say things like, uh, the guy might want to live with his sister. <laughs> they are not fleshed out medical parole plans. And what the department is saying is basically what the department is doing in the grants is they're in the, when it's grand is they're basically shifting to the parole department at the close, the obligation to find, set, confirm, vet, and then, and then they're holding on to the prisoner until parole does the job that the department was supposed to do between zero and 21. But it, so then according to Buckman, I'm sorry, according to Buckman, isn't it supposed to be a collaborative process where uh, the DOC works with the, the people who are assigned to the, the um, facility and along with uh, people like yourself and um, 
prisoner's family members to put together a plan. I mean, they may not always be the ones uh, with the most information about what's available to the prisoner. They're supposed to be, to this day, not. I'm sorry? Oh, okay. So it's supposed to be collaborative. That's what you're saying. It's supposed to be collaborative, but the department declines to collaborate. And in this case, again, with these two people here in this case, um, were they granted the medical parole before or after Buckman? After. Okay. The Department of Corrections uh, lists a whole, uh, I'm sorry, lists a, a whole litany of reasons why they can't plan ahead of time. But the, they're basically arguing, I mean, it, my argument is two parts. First of all, they have to. But what they're saying is first, they don't have to. And second of all, if they did have to, they just can't because it's too hard to do. Well, and isn't it true or, or is it true that some, some um, places that have beds won't say yes until the person is granted medical parole? Is that true? Judge, some might, but uh, many do. And in fact, Sharon Health Center, which is one of those referenced, does. And so that's why I think we didn't receive any facts on the, the department is trying to argue these difficulties by affidavit filed with its brief. If the, if the court is going to decide that the department is excused from its job because it's, the job is just too hard to do, then we'll, it needs to be set before a special master or a single justice for an evidentiary hearing on that topic. They can't just say too hard to do, here's my affidavit, because we contest all those facts and I made a motion to strike them. Certainly for Mr. Vinnie and for Mr. Malloy, where the department is arguing that uh, there can't be a, a, an application for out-of-state parole made until after a defendant is uh, granted medical parole, that's simply untrue. It's simply untrue uh, in Mr. Vinny's case that there were outstanding warrants. It's untrue that the Farron Health Center won't take, won't uh, evaluate you before a release date is granted. Uh, in Mr. Adrian's case, where I attended the record, um, I'm sorry, I think I did, or I'm happy to. Uh, it, the, the department uh, spent five months and a social worker for CPCS did it in 72 hours, found a place. In Mr. Vasquez's case, which the court can take judicial notice, the department spent four months and made four phone calls during that time. Can I, can I pose a hypothetical to you? Um, so remind me of the different time frames because this is a very short compressed time period. What, what the commissioner has to do and what the parole board has to do, it's six, within 66 days. Go ahead, tell me quickly, and then I want to close yeah, the question. It's, beautif it's beautifully laid out in the parole department brief. Uh, the, the department makes a plan between zero and day 21, and they must make a plan, and you've ordered them to do it. It's a statute, it's common law, and what a plan is is laid out, and it includes a home plan, and includes, and they have to make really contingent plans because I know nobody knows where they're going. So they could make three plans so that the guy can be ready on day 66. Then parole takes over. So, so on day parole 66. checks the plan and sets the conditions. So okay. everything is ready to drop on day 66. Okay, but they, the world doesn't, I, I mean, I'm familiar with the fact of these two because I was a single justice and it, right. it was complicated. Um, but let, let me just talk you through a second. So, the critical factors are we need this person to have a safe place to go. And because these are deathly ill people, they need a place where they're going to get appropriate medical treatment and a place to stay, right? Right. So they need health care. Mass Health needs to do what it needs to do, right? Right. Mass Health needs to do something, and somebody needs to accept this person, right? right. What happens if, what happens if, Everyone does the best they possibly can, and those two things aren't in place. Do, do we order them home? <laughs> what, what, what do we do? Because we're concerned. I understand he's been found no longer dangerous, no longer a safety issue, but he's a danger to himself if he's not properly cared for and protected. So if things don't work out, what do we do? Do we leave him with you? Um, Let me give you we, a variety of answers. Well, but, but I'd like you to accept the hypothetical that sometimes we do the best we can 
and we don't succeed. Okay. Um, so uh, several, what's going to happen on day 66 if that happens? Several possibilities. Okay. One is, uh, the, the, in a case where the defendant did not want to be released because of the risk to himself, we, there exists the possibility of waiver. Second, uh, as the, in the brief filed by PLS on this question, the state hospital could take somebody. They're obligated to under the statute. It's a great brief by PLS. So Third, that's, a, that's an option for us. So if, again, we do the best we can and we don't succeed, we can just order the person to the state hospital. Yes, in the uh, interim. It, that wouldn't release, I mean, what the department is trying to do here basically is not do its job because the department could set up contingency plans, just like you would a person would for their father. If he's this sick, he'll go to Aunt Rachel in Riverdale. If he's sicker than that, he'll go to the Hebrew home. Mr. Greenberg, uh, Ms. Greenberg, I, having dealt with this myself, it's not easy. Um, I but I you, do wanna say you, that you last, year, last year, the department argued, I mean, this is what's called in British media, reverse ferret argument. The department argued last year that this was so easy that the blind and deaf could do it without the ability to make collect phone calls. It's not that hard. And when you do contingent planning, that's what I'm trying to express, it's less hard. So that where the department has passed regulations, which are entirely ultra various, saying that the department can just wait as long as they want to while parole gets around to applying for out-of-state parole, the default position is custody, that, that's not doing their job. The default position is a plan in Massachusetts while waiting for, for out-of-state parole. The default plan is not he's safe, he, you know, he's fine, he's qualified, but we're just gonna keep him in prison an extra month and a half because we don't wanna make a four week plan and a three month plan. They have to make two plans. That's what you do for your dad. And it's what they should be doing for the prisoners. Two plans, maybe even three plans. Because what we're seeing is the department is applying to places one at a time. We don't do that for college. So what I'm saying, and we're not seeing collaboration, even now on cases where the department is ordered to create a real parole plan by the superior courts, the department is refusing to collaborate. So we're not, we're not seeing it. The, uh, it. We're just in practice, the department has to be held to its duty by day 21. And then we have to fix mistakes of fact between day 21 and day 66. They have to work with us. And then we could, they can't just say that the default position for a person entitled to release is prison. It's, it's, it's not what the legislature said. The legislature said, get to work and find them somebody. And I'm gonna echo back again, it's tremendously expensive. It's $300,000 for a very sick prisoner to be maintained at the Department of Corrections. There's no private pay nursing home that costs that. They could have a contingent release to first available mass health rest home and the, the, we would, the, the public fisc. It's Ms. Greenberg, just again, factually, it seems like Farron, everyone keeps coming back to Farron. How many, you know, you've been doing this, how many of the nursing homes are taking people like this? Because um, it seems like we, we don't have a unlimited number of options. We have very few of these places that are willing to take sex offenders and first degree murderers. Yeah, it's, it's not correct. This is okay, but what, what is your, based on the record, what is your record that we turn to for how many options there are like that? Just in, in generalities, I find this thing much easier than when we actually look at facts here. So tell me in the record, how many places take first degree murderers and and repeat sex offenders like we're dealing with here? Judge, the House of Hope in New Bedford accepted uh, Mr. Adry within 72 hours. And he is, he's, was a his... second, he's a second degree murderer. They will accept, they have expressed their willingness 
to accept Terry Abercrombie, who is a sex offender following a manslaughter conviction, and they have expressed their willingness to do that. The House of Hope has accepted parolees till way before I heard them. Parole is intimately familiar with the organization. That's only one. For Mr. Adrian, we found four, who has convicted of second degree murder, we found four places within three days. Hey, can, can I could, could you clarify something for me, Ms. Greenberg? Yeah. The, um, you had mentioned the state hospital. So you're, you're referring to the non-secure section of Shattuck, correct? I, I, the Department of, uh, I'm sorry, Prisoners Legal Services has briefed DPH as a, as a last resort, but certainly the Shattuck for hospitalized patients, a uh, hospitalized patient can go to the free side of the Shattuck. Yeah. And, and, and your, your position is, even in a, in a situation of last resort, there's always that possibility, uh, other than uh, jail, of course. I can't testify with certainty as to bed availability at the show. Right, I was going to ask you that about, about the capacity, but uh, yeah. that might be outside. Yeah, the these, these are fact-bound questions. I wouldn't expect this court at this time without a fact basis to say this job is too hard for the Department of Corrections to do. Which is why you urge us a, a master or some type of remand. Right, but frankly, I don't think that's the problem because with more money, they could do it. The, what, are you, are you, us, go ahead, are you also asking us to rule that 66 days is 66 days, that they yes. are out? Um, yes. Even though we have all this factual uncertainty out there, 66 days means 66 days, and they go no matter what. That's your Absent, position, right? Absent a waiver, because they can always go to a DPH facility under the statute uh, briefed by the, by the PLS. There is nobody with nowhere to go. They can go to DPH. The statute provides for that when a person is sick. That's a, in, I'm sorry for not immediately coming to the number. Please look at the PLS brief. Or they can go, they can, if they were taken out in, in a hospitalized person and wheeled to the Brigham, the Brigham would be obliged to accept them and then they could die free at the Brigham. All they need is outpatient mass health and they would be, they could just trundle them over, the Brigham would be obliged to take them and they could, they don't, and the Commonwealth would not be obligated to pay for four armed guards for a I'm guy. Confused. I'm confused by that. They, they're they're going to take them in emer to the emergency room at Brigham um, and say, here, he's your problem. Is that, is that really a solution? That, that, is that really what you want to have happen, that we're going to drop them at the teaching hospitals um, just at their front door and put them in the emergency room? That, that, that can't be what Judge, you're doing. I'm not suggesting that's optimum. I'm suggesting that the department do its job, do its job as the statute requires them to do and from which the court can't excuse them on the argument that they're finding it a little tricky. They have $800,000 in their budget for re-entry planning. Every hospital in Massachusetts does re-entry planning. Every nursing home does re-entry planning and somehow they manage it. The only people who can't manage re-entry planning is the Department of Corrections and that's because they don't want to. Thank you, Ms. Greenberg. Any further questions? Right, um, thank you, Ms. Ga Mr. Gaskell. Thank you, Your Honor, Your Honors, uh, and good morning. I am here with uh, Darcy Curry, who is my co-counsel on this, and I just wanted to take a moment to thank her uh, for all her efforts in the brief and in uh, helping me prepare for this or oral argument. Um, what we ha have here, just as we had before, are, are two distinct questions, uh, irrespective of any individual inmate. Um, and they're not about the extent of the commissioner's discretion, they're, and they're not about who is eligible for medical parole. They're, at, they're about what happens after that becomes uh, a certainty, after the commissioner has agreed that this person is entitled to, to medical parole, is eligible for medical parole. Um, and in answering the first question, I would say that the statute is silent as to who is required to find the plan or find the uh, suitable home placement. Um, and silent as to the timing of such efforts. Um, Wait a minute, the, can I ask you a question? I understand what the statute says, but if you keep 
uh, Buckman, uh, if, you, if you take that into consideration, is it not true that the DOC is supposed to work collaboratively with um, people who are assigned to the facility and with the prisoner and, and the prisoner's council and all of that to put together a plan? Absolutely. Including a place to live? Including a place to live, and that is a plan, and it's a proposed plan, but as everyone who's ever made plans know, plans don't always come to fruition the way that they thought that they would. Um, there's no denial here that uh, the department is responsible for submitting a proposed home placement, um, but that home placement is proposed and not finalized. And I think that's the distinction here that needs to be made. There's a difference between securing a home plan, finalizing a home plan, and proposing a home plan. Um, and 1709 of the Control and EOPS regulation does provide a mechanism where a decision looks likely uh, that, that the commissioner will grant medical parole. She refers the petition, including uh, the superintendent's recommendation and the proposed home plan or, and proposed overall medical plan to the parole board for further investigation and to set the terms and conditions of parole. Um, 1711 also allows the commissioner to set separate conditions uh, before the release on medical parole. Uh, and that is where the authority here is to say, we would grant this inmate medical parole. We did, the commissioner has determined him eligible for medical parole, uh, but he simply doesn't have a place to go at the moment. Um, the commissioner will, will grant, the, grant medical parole and allow for medical parole release to occur upon the securement of a home plan. And that is the uh, best plan or the best operation of how to satisfy the legislative intent. The legislative intent would absolutely not be for the commissioner to say he's otherwise eligible, but he doesn't have anywhere to go, so he's denied medical parole. But, that, shouldn't, that is but shouldn't the commissioner be monitoring the entire system for availability um, ahead of time? I, I'm, I'm confused by this idea that, I mean, obviously the legislature wants these people released so that they can die at home or die out of prison. It's the, it doesn't seem to make sense to me that we're waiting to the tail end of this when it's a system-wide problem. I mean, just dealing with Ruth, Judge, Mrs. Greenberg's clients, we got, there's a flow of them continuously going through the system. Shouldn't there be continuous monitoring of openings out there so when this actually happens, we, okay, this is a bed that will accept sex offenders. This is a bed that will accept murderers so that we don't start over on day 59, I mean, we don't start the actual mass health prop process. Maybe that's more complicated, but we don't at least look for the bed after everything's decided. No, absolutely, Your Honor. And, and it's not that we don't look for the bed, um, but as reported in our brief and from information received um, from a, a majority of facilities will not even begin to consider whether somebody was a uh, acceptable for the that bed that you just discussed before there has been a grant of medical parole. So it's a chicken and the egg situation. Why, what, why is that? What, why, isn't, why isn't it a criteria-based decision whether someone, oh, I mean, they don't have to, I mean, is it, an in, is it a necessarily individualized decision? And that's why it's not a criteria-based decision. This is a person who needs intensive care and is a sex offender or this is a person who is a murderer and needs 24 hour monitoring. I'm, I'm just confused. I, by I, I think it's both. It's both our criteria as we have had facilities report um, certain class is of former inmates and for based on certain convic convictions um, will not be allowed to be admitted regardless. That's a blanket ban. But then it also is an absolutely individualized evaluation process. And most of the time from what we've heard from facilities is they won't even begin that evaluation until a grant of medical parole has occurred. Um, so again, we could propose the Farron Center and the Farron Center is where a number uh, of inmates have gone, but it's a proposal and the Farron Center will only start considering after a grant of medical parole. And I, I just like to speak to your earlier question. It's, it's not that we're waiting until the last, you know, day 59, day 60, you know, the, the process does the regulation does allow for when uh, or does require the commissioner to transmit uh, the entirety of the petition, including any proposed home plans, to the parole board within 30 days of receipt from the superintendent's recommendation. 
Um, and so that would allow the commissioner to, to have had an initial look at it. She determined uh, that that release looks likely and she wants to begin the process as soon as, uh, as, soon as possible. And, and it, that kind of jumps into the second question here um, that the statutory and regulatory scheme in this case don't prescribe that the 66 days applies to release. The 66 can days- I, Can I interrupt you uh, here? Um, I've heard a lot about the regulatory scheme here. Um, and I would like to know, uh, cause I'm a little confused about this. Was the regulatory scheme one that was in place at the time of Buckman? Have we ever ruled on this regulatory scheme? Is this regulatory scheme that you're relying upon something that we are uh, to review in the context of this uh, litigation or uh, because I hear um, uh, Ms. Greenberg referring to this as ultra vires uh, uh, regulation. And I'm just curious about the dates and whether or not we've passed on it and whether or not it's up for review uh, because as ultra vires now. So the regulatory scheme has, was adjusted following the Buckman decision has been promulgated. The specific regulations related to this uh, procedure in terms of release uh, in, the, in the transfer to the parole board were not part of the sections that were invalid or were, were deemed invalid uh, in the Buckman decision. So those are have the they been, have, they, have, they, have they been uh, addressed in Buckman? They weren't specifically addressed in Buckman, no. Okay, so they've never been addressed by us, in other words. You're saying not in an encompassing way they must have been because we didn't say anything about them in Buckman, but, but that's sort of a negative implication. We've never really, in fact, addressed them. Absolutely. And, and, and these okay. regulations, there's nothing in the regulation that specifically says uh, the commissioner may hold indefinitely and, and the, the commissioner and the department as a whole understands the legislative intent here uh, was very much influenced by the speed in which the inmate would be released. Obviously, the timeline was set uh, in an effort to get them released as soon as possible. But more important than the speed here is the legislative intent, and, and Justice Caffrey, you brought it up, um, that the, the legislative intent for the medical care for these inmates uh, and for the public safety and welfare, because it doesn't serve the public safety or welfare to uh, release them to the street, especially when given the, the fact that they've been granted medical parole, they have significant medical concerns and, and it certainly doesn't serve their interest in being released to the street. And, well, and wait, so- wait, 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 I don't think she's saying that she's gonna release them to the street. I don't think that that's the uh, alternative at all that she's suggesting is the uh, possibility. But there's always a possibility of some other place. It may not be ideal, but there's not, it's not the streets. I, I would argue that in some inmates' cases, there's not a possibility of another uh -huh. place. What um, about the it, state hospital? The state hospital. So the regulation relied on there uh, is a chapter 151, section one, or sorry, chapter 127, section 151. And if you read this, uh, in reading the statute, the language is clear that that obligation only kicks in at the expiration of a sentence. And the expiration of a sentence is not, as discussed in the previous matter, uh, is not while somebody still is on medical parole. That, the sentence has not expired. And for some who are uh, the, those who have been convicted of life sentences, their, their, expiration, their sentence essentially never, is expi it never expires. As a further matter, this was not uh, brought up, uh, raised by any party here. Obviously, uh, PLS has raised it, um, but we can't speak for DPH. DPH is not a, uh, not a, a party to this case. Um, and but you're saying that you're saying you are affirmatively saying that the streets are the alternative. You're, you're affirmatively saying something, aren't you? You're not saying just that that uh, this subject is uh, verboten outside of our. Uh, you're saying something that uh, is in fact factually determinable, right? I I I apologize if I misspoke. I didn't mean to say that the answer is actually the streets. I I I more meant to say um, that the alternative would potentially be homelessness. Uh, for some inmates who haven't been able to find placement. Uh, but we do place within the DPH system. The DPH system uh, has accepted uh, one inmate uh, and it's on a case by case basis. And even that's st the statute uh, of section 151, at, at most I think that would require the DPH to consider these inmates on a case to case basis because again, they might not be the best facility to allow for them to, to allow for the treatment of that inmate. Um, and, and I do just want to briefly address, uh, beyond the two questions that were reported here, uh, Justice Kafka requested a, a series of factual information. Um, I do apologize, but the clock seems to have left my screen. Oh, I see it now. Thank you. You're, 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 uh, o you're over time, so sum up. Okay, so very quickly, uh, a number of inmates have been released. Uh, and if you look at the statistical average of the inmates outside of a few outliers, um, this was 
this is a process that is working similar to that of parole. Um, and, and I would just uh, hope that the, the brief is, and the statistics that were provided by the reentry efforts uh, were duly considered and, and the fact that this is working, uh, it's just some inmates take longer than others. Thank, thank you, your you. honors. Thank you, Mr. Gasco. Mr. Ravitz. <clears throat> thank you, Randall Ravitz for the parole board. Uh, the medical parole statute and regulation should be construed in a way that furthers the various goals of the legislature and that's consistent with reason and common sense. While the scheme presents substantial challenges, the parole board is committed to fulfilling its own obligations within the process. In answer to the reported questions, the scheme contemplates that officials will identify and investigate placement options within the 66 days leading up to the deadline for the commissioner's decision. It assigns certain tasks to parole board prior to that deadline, but no role for the parole board in finding a placement after that deadline. Of course, there may be some cases where, despite best efforts, locating a suitable placement simply proves impossible. And in those cases, the DOC commissioner could rationally conclude that she cannot find the statutory standard met. But if the commissioner does determine that the, stat the standard is met, then officials should generally act with reasonable promptness to affect the prisoner's release. That is after a short period of time for the statutory notification process. After all, expedition was clearly one of the legislature's goals as this court recognized in Buckman. At the same time, expedition was not the legislature's only goal. There were clearly others. Uh, among them were furthering the health and safety interests of the prisoner and the public, ensuring adequate financial coverage, ensuring that released prisoners will comply with the law and be adequately supervised and compassion. And in circumstances where expedition would not further the legislature's goals, and may even be in derogation of certain goals, a reasonable pro postponement of release should not be entirely foreclosed. To be clear, we are not arguing that release could be postponed infinitely, as has been suggested, or simply at the whim of DOC. We are largely just encouraging the court not to adopt a rule providing the DOC must release someone immediately in every case, even if it would be in derogation of the legislature's goals. So I uh, can entertain any uh, questions from the court. And it, if, if there are none, then we will rest on our brief. I think Justice Kafka has a question. He's unmuted now. Yeah, um, I'm unmuted too, so go ahead. I'm, I'm trying, and that sounds great in the abstract, what you just said. Um, I'm just trying to understand though how, what it means. Um, and what, so what, what potential justifications would there be for going beyond the 66 days? That the placement hasn't been identified, um, that it's not a good placement. I'm just trying to get a sense of that. Mm -hmm. Right. Let's say the, the 66 day deadline is approaching right. and we just have no idea, or I should say DOC just has no idea where this person is going to go. Um, DOC, the commissioner would certainly be within its discretion, uh, exercising its discretion appropriately to deny release um, if the commissioner can't reasonably find the statutory standard to be met. But let's say we're approaching the 66 day deadline and everything seems to be in place. We're just waiting on one little um, detail to be um, dealt with. We're waiting on, let's say, uh, well, let's, a form let's, to be Let's, let's yes. say that detail is that the best place is the Farron Center, but they want to do an individualized determination and they're not sure they're going to have a bed. They may have a bed. Um, DPH isn't a great solution. So can you just keep them there for months or how does it work? You know, I'm just, again, I, I understand hard and fast rules present problems in something this complex, but I'm just trying to get a sense of how we put teeth in meaningful standards in place that both sides can live with. Well, if DOC is essentially saying we, we can't release this person until this qualification is met because it would be uh, contrary to the, the public interest and contrary to the, 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 the safety and the health of this prisoner, then the question becomes, so then how can the, the statutory standard be found met? Um, and if the statutory standard is found met, then release should be affected 
as we say, with reasonable promptness. Now, let's say, though, that something happens. The, the uh, placement is lined up, the facility is, everything is in place, and then the facility closes its doors, goes out of business. Um, then the, the statute, read literally, would, would still say that the person needs to be released, but it would seem to be in derogation of the legislature's goals for the person to be released immediately where it would endanger them, maybe endanger the public. So there, it would be consistent with the legislature's intent for there to be a reasonable postponement. But the trouble is the reasonableness is in the eye of the beholder, isn't it? Yes. I mean, it's, you know, it, quite, quite honestly, uh, adopting a, a reasonableness standard I think has benefits because all these situations are unique, they're unusual, the statute is still new, but yeah, it's the kind of thing where it's gonna result in challenges and, and it's going to, we're all going, going to have to figure out what reasonableness means, but that's true with any reasonableness standard in the law and we, uh, it's applied in other situations and it, it's just something that- um, Where did 66 come from? I'm sorry? Where did, the, where did the number 66 come from? It seems like a particularly okay. unusual it's, number. Right, right. It results uh, from the, the addition of, uh, of uh, excuse me, uh, 21 and, um, I'm sorry, I'm just, 21 and 45. So it's the 21 days um, between the petition and the superintendent or sheriff sending a recommendation and the other materials to the commissioner and the 45 days after the commissioner receives a petition from the superintendent or sheriff and then has to issue a decision. So that's how we get the, this, the 66. Mr. Rav, is it, is it too simplistic to have a fail safe in that um, if everything goes haywire and, and, the, and the plans don't go right, the person could get released to the not secure side of Shattuck or have some other place to go other than the street or being held and continue to be held in custody? Well, the, that um, brings to mind the, the argument that's uh, put forth by prisoner, prisoner legal services that uh, some people have, have referred to. And um, that, the, the statute there, um, chapter 127, section 151, it's, it's tempting um, and it looks like it, it provides a solution, but there are, some, there are some questions there about whether it would really apply because it begins with the words when a prisoner at the expiration of his sentence as as no i'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about the statute I, okay. I, I know there's a statute and that that could be disputed but if if we say 66 days means 66 days and the person has to be released is it too simplistic or is it desirable to have some type of fail safe to say um, rather than keep the person in prison or kick them out on the front steps of Cedar Junction, you can go to Shattuck or some other place. That, that, would, that would be a solution and that would be, seem to be consistent with what the legislature intended. Uh, as opposed to having it be the uh, continuation of custody as the default position. Right. How many beds are in Shattuck? And how many beds are we talking about? I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, okay, because, you know, the idea that there's a fail safe. Uh, I, 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 right, and that's, that's why I asked if it was too simplistic and perhaps council could uh, supplement the record with this information. If uh, that's the danger of simplistic solutions sometimes, I guess, but maybe you'll tell us otherwise. Okay, if, if there are no other questions uh, from the court. Thank you, Mr. Rabbits. Thank you.